The Tales series of games is a rather old one, with a long history of games ranging from Japan exclusive titles to modern hits such as the latest in the series, Tales of Arise. It's not as old as Final Fantasy, starting life on the SNES rather than the NES, but the series has racked up more mainline titles over the course of 26 years. Currently, there's 17 main games in the series, as well as a fair number of Japanese exclusive spin-offs, but most of the main games are translated to English in some form now, mostly through remakes. The series in general is considered the third biggest JRPG franchise, sitting closely behind Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. Tales offers a different experience to those though. Final Fantasy has evolved into a more action-oriented series as the years have gone by, but the focus on the series has consistently been evolving, changing the battle system and driving them with cutting-edge visuals and technology, whereas Dragon Quest has stuck firmly to its turn-based battles and Akira Toriyama art style, with little changes over the years. Tales offers a deep, action-focused battle system throughout the series, battles playing out like fighting or brawling games, with additions and improvements made to it every entry. The series also leans heavily into the anime aesthetic. The anime style, I think, has been chosen for more than one reason. In general, the premise for the games feels more generic anime at times, and with the rate of releases with the series, keeps the budget of the games low. You won't find the intricate detail of the Final Fantasy series here, nor will you find the strong stylistic choices found in the Dragon Quest series. Instead, you'll find more generic and cookie-cutter-looking character and monster designs. A lot of them aren't bad, but if you come to the series from one of the two I've mentioned, Tales' designs certainly can come across as painfully generic. These are just the surface-level details, of course, and while the presentation of the series maybe isn't its strong suit, it certainly has other things going for it. I've seen people describe the series as JRPG comfort food, and I think that's honestly a brilliant way to describe the series. So, as someone who wanted to get into the series somewhat, I started tackling some of the entries, poking my nose in to see how I felt about them within a few hours of playing them at least. It's nice to expand your horizons sometimes, after all. Tales of Zestiria So, this was my first game and first complete title in the Tales series. I enjoyed it a fair bit and even made a review of it on Steam, which I'll repeat here and then expand on some points. The story is kind of cliche and predictable, but what makes up for it is the characters. The main cast is likeable and the game focuses on the interpersonal interactions quite a fair bit. Saray is a bit of a bland main character, but he's not overwhelmingly annoying or anything like that either, so it's fine. He has a little bit of growth over the course of the story, but he's mostly there just to be the naive audience surrogate and overall good guy. The combat is a lot of fun, although way too overly complex with all the mechanics it vomits at you. The basics are rather simple, but there's so many other things going on on top of it such as assigning martial arts, equipment skills, equipment fusion, farming gear with stats if you so desire, battle actions, mystic arts, lord of the land systems. It's rather overwhelming, with a lot of it seeming easy enough to ignore, I suppose, while providing something for people to sink their teeth into for the more challenging content. I personally just found it to be bloat, however, with tutorials for the different systems being part of the monuments found throughout the world, which I found to be a bit of a disappointing aspect of the world. Overall though, the game is fun, charming and enjoyable. I'll probably look back fondly on the main characters of this adventure, but maybe not the adventure itself. The monuments, all being tutorials for different systems, was such a big sticking point for me. The story of the game hyped these up as being ancient knowledge or scripture from an old culture, and yet all they deemed fit to write was how to chain battle arts together or something. A very disappointing aspect of the world building and a huge missed opportunity in my opinion. I guess in a way they technically do pass on knowledge which fits within the narrative, but it's presented in such a meta-textual way that it just took me out of the game a bit. The battle system being surprisingly complex is something that's recurring in this series. This game being my first experience with it, I felt it to be overwhelming. I think this is mostly due to poor tutorials, as explanations come mostly in the form of huge text dumps, without either explaining why you'd want to use a system, nor showing how it works properly. This is made even worse by the fact that some of these tutorials hide more details in the monuments, so total understanding of a mechanic or system may not come until you randomly come across it in the world. I got through the game fine, but I did feel like I missed something about the battle system, and I wish I was made more aware of that while I was playing it. Grumblings aside, the combat is quite fun. I like the armor ties mechanic, adding a bit more strategy to the character you pair with, as they all have their strengths and weaknesses. In particular, I enjoyed how quick the battles played out, as I mentioned earlier, making the battles feel like a brawler or anime fighting game. I just wish it was a little clearer when it came to explaining some of the mechanics. The problem I think just being a couple too many of them. I really cannot stress enough how enjoyable I found the cast in the game to be. While the overarching narrative I found myself not being overly invested in, the characters carried the story hard. 
Saray, as I mentioned, is kind of a bland main character, but his worldview is legitimately challenged in places and it's compelling to see him go through it, backed up by a colourful cast of characters. To the point that a character death two to three quarters of the way through actually came as a shock and affected me a little. I probably wouldn't have had that reaction if I wasn't somewhat invested in the character themselves. Rose as a character I think is very effective for the story of the game. She's a bit of a goof, in fact she's quite a bit of a goof in places, uh, which explains why she gets on with Saray so much. Uh, she's dealt with having to murder people for the greater good, and as such challenges Saray's naive worldview with her greater outlook on life. This does tie into the ending eventually too, where committing what Saray would consider an ultimate sin turns out to be the only just and least destructive way to end things. It requires fully understanding their opponent, and the ability to do that was mostly given to him through his interactions with Rose. I'm dumbing down the nuances here a lot, but it makes sense, trust me. This being my first game in the series, I think a lot of the reason I like the characters so much, and the dynamic, is thanks to the skits. This isn't as much a feature in the other two major JRPG series, so it was cool to see a way for the characters to have an excuse to interact with each other more often, showing some of the more mundane interactions to flesh out their personalities, and can sometimes even pay off within the story itself too. Playing through this, though, I got bitten somewhat by the Tales bug, and so sought out some of the other games in the series to have a go at. Tales of Hearts, ah. Oh. So, Tales of Hearts was one of the games I picked up on my Vita while I was about three quarters of the way done with Tales of Vesisteria. I got it because in my work there is often a fair bit of downtime where I can sneak in a bit of mobile gaming. I thought to myself, well, since I'm planning on playing through a bunch of these games, why not get one for the portable system? It was released on the DS originally in Japan and is considered the 11th main entry in the series. It seems to be the product of members from the 2D and 3D game teams working together on one project for the first time, and as such the theme of the game was set to be a meeting of the hearts, and through this meeting, uniting to overcome difficulty in their lives. It all sounds very heartwarming and optimistic, which is honestly refreshing for an RPG story currently, but how does this game put across these themes, at least early on? Playing through the few hours in I have so far has been what I could only really describe as, uh, weird. I initially got about an hour in before kind of completely bouncing off it, put off mostly by the main character and the dynamic between the initial three party members. The protagonist, Core Meteor, not only has one of the stupidest names in video games, but is also cursed with the most annoying of anime tropes. The naive kid with his heart on his sleeve. He's overly enthusiastic about almost everything and exclaims stuff in a very quick and loud manner. He lives in a town of only a few people, and is granted as a powerful magic user who wishes to pass on his skills. It's all terribly cliched, which obviously means Kor's mentor slash father figure has to die in the opening minutes to motivate him. His interactions with the girl he finds washed up on the beach also stinks of the weird infatuation that a character like Kor seems obliged to have. What really turned me off him was in a skit where he wishes she didn't wake up so he would have had to perform mouth to mouth, which is uh, honestly just a creepy thought to have. The two grow close quickly, and this is another thing that's hard to take seriously in any way. They mostly bond over Kor believing her about the girl who lives in the head, but Kor is either stupid or just agreeing to be nice. Besides, she's characterised as being responsible and relatively serious, so her becoming infatuated with this bonehead, who's only useful to her as a means to an end, kind of rubs me the wrong way, I guess. But then again, what do I know about women? After some shenanigans, she becomes infested with something that only people who have the power to enter the heart of another using a soma can accomplish. Which means that obviously this is a job for Kor to mess up. And he does so thoroughly, essentially smashing her soul to pieces that scatter across the world, with each piece representing part of her personality. And this brings me to her brother, who makes up the majority of party interactions in the early game. Him and Kor basically just shout at each other a lot. Him with anger, and Kor with his enthusiasm. It is very grating. What makes it worse is that these two just shout at each other for the majority of the first couple of hours, which makes getting through it incredibly tough. I don't really blame her brother for being mad at Kor. It's obviously supposed to be played for laughs, with name calling and the over-the-top melodrama of it all, but it's just not something that gels with me, I suppose. I will say that the combat system is very fun in this game. It's pretty standard Tales fare, with most enemies being quite uninspired in terms of their design. However, the mechanics themselves are fast and fluid. It feels just as good to do the juggling and fighting game-esque in this portable title as it, as it does in the best combat systems in the console entries. All in all, Tales of Hearts is a fun pastime, but doesn't seem like the narrative has the chops to make it memorable. The characters in this game are heavily outmatched by the cast of the other games. 
if you can get this game cheap, then the gameplay alone may make Tales of Hearts R worth picking up. But as for it being a good Tales game and a worthy RPG, uh, I'd look elsewhere in the series to get your fix. Tales of Berseria. This is a prequel to Tales of Zestiria, set thousands of years in the past. So far that it means you don't really have to have played Zestiria to understand it. You'll obviously pick up on nods and slight references, but that's about it. From what I've played though, this is pretty much the game Zestiria should have been. The story is far more engaging, the combat is smoother and just overall better. And so far, the characters have been on par with how fun they are. They're like the total opposite. Instead of goody two-shoes for the most part, we instead have lovable rogues, with the main character being on a rather understandable quest for vengeance from the off, as opposed to, I just really like ruins. Amazing this came out only a year later. However, that quick turnaround does show itself in a few key areas. Mostly, this is evident from the graphics and the world design. The graphics engine is clearly almost the same as Tales of Zestiria, with basically zero upgrades in terms of the graphical fidelity, other than it performs better on PC without mods. The biggest evidence of the quick development time is shown in the world design. The monsters are directly copy and pasted from Zestiria, which makes positioning it as a prequel as an excuse to reuse assets, perhaps? And the design of the dungeons and the way that the missions are structured are quite repetitive. The design of the dungeons in Zestiria was never going to win any awards. However, I'd argue that in Berseria the dungeons are longer, more repetitive, and you sometimes must go through them a couple of times. I noticed that the early missions had me going to a few locations back and forth a lot, making it seem very much like filler. Like it was buying time so they could wring every scrap of content from the available space. There's also a strange addition of a real-time ship management minigame. I kind of get its addition. Over the course of the story, you essentially start up a small band of pirates. However, the way it's implemented is very weird. It feels like they added a little mobile game into the middle of this JRPG, and I'm overall puzzled by its inclusion. I sure hope a strong weapon or something isn't locked behind this feature. I suppose it's useful for getting a few extra crafting and cooking materials. The combat, at least, is pretty much a straight upgrade from Zestiria. It's by and large the same, however it just seems to feel smoother, is a little simpler without losing complexity, and has a more visceral edge to it thanks to Velvet's demonic powers. With all the supporting characters being demons too, there's less of them falling into standard archetypes, meaning that their powers are a little more different and chaotic compared to the more traditional party of Zestiria. Creating combos is still pretty cool, with various combos and moves being more useful against different opponents with an option to customise mid-battle. To an extent, I feel this improvement over Zestiria carries over to Berseria's story too. As I mentioned, Velvet's quest for revenge is instantly more engaging than the sort of generic saviour story of the previous entry. Velvet is betrayed by someone she thought she could trust, and loses her little brother as a sacrifice in some sort of ritual. It's kind of messed up, and you instantly get on side with Velvet as a protagonist because of it. This experience ends up with Velvet having both a personality change, understandably so, and being a wielder of demonic powers. She's clearly traumatised by all that's happened, especially having to stew in her own company for three years in a dank prison, having only her dark thoughts and the monsters they kick down to feed her on for company. She is very determined about this quest for revenge. Consequences be damned. This is certainly one of the darker entries in the series, but still retains a lot of the usual charm of its characters. All the characters are demons or quote-unquote bad guys in some form or another. This allows the writers to have some fun with them, and produces a chaotic cast of misfits to adventure with. Velvet's outfit is a little ridiculous, I'll agree. However, it does make sense. No, don't go, let me explain. Her mental and physical state is basically in tatters, right? and she's been a prisoner for years and this outfit is made from scrap she's found. In a way, it represents her wild and barbaric nature, uncaring in her lust for revenge. Her hair is long and on the verge of unruly. It's a great anime design, while being unmistakably anime in its, uh, aesthetics? I overall quite like it though, mostly because it's not Velvet's only trait and she's an incredibly well-written character otherwise. At the end of it all, I think Berseria is a really great game and will probably be the next in the series I finish all the way despite my little niggles regarding the level and world design. Tales of Vesperia This was originally an Xbox 360 exclusive, most probably in a bid by Microsoft to get the Japanese audience interested in their console, along with Lost Odyssey. Unlike Lost Odyssey though, Tales of Vesperia has escaped its exclusivity and has released on a lot of major platforms, including a remaster on newer consoles and PC. The weirdest part of the remaster is the fact that Troy Baker didn't reprise his role as the main character for newly voiced lines. 
It's kind of understandable as Troy is a much bigger name now than he was a decade ago, and so is more expensive, to the point it may have been out of the remaster's budget, but this is kind of a blow against the fans. Surely Bandai Namco could still afford him. More cynically, I feel it's more that they couldn't get away with penny-pinching the fees due to Troy being a member of a voice actor union, and so can't avoid the royalties he'd request. Regardless, the voice actor who voices the new lines can sound weird at times, but he has a similar enough timber to Troy's that it's not too jarring. This place is going to become an aquarium soon if this keeps up. Listen to those guys. Poor Hanks. Can't really argue with them about the junk thing, though. The gameplay won't be a surprise to any of you by now. Action combat that plays out in a 3D environment with 2D brawler slash fighting game elements. It's certainly one of the most polished versions of this combat system, though. Compared to the games that released prior to it, there's a smoothness and responsiveness to it that feels just right, and you quickly build up a neat little repertoire of arts and skills. There is a way to play the other characters in combat, but you need to synthesize a special item for it first. I'm not entirely sure why this is done this way, but I'm happy to just play as Yuri for the most part. Speaking of Yuri, let's touch on the characters and the story of Tales of Asperia. As usual for the series so far, the story is okay. It's fine. It's pretty simple so far, a few hours into the game. There's special jewels or devices called Blastia, which power the various forms of magic in the world, with the inciting instant being someone stealing the water Blastia from the fountain of the district Yuri lives in. Yuri is an ex-knight, his reasons for leaving being unknown. He's a troublemaker, but does so to help others. His reactions to the way the richer districts of the town treat those poorer than them is evidence of this. Clearly, Yuri is a good person, even if he feels he doesn't deserve that label at times. The people of the lower district clearly admire him, to the point they purposely cause a commotion to cover his escape from the city when the broader adventure begins. Pretty early on, Yuri crosses path with the second main character of the game, Estelise, or Estelle for short. Estelle is a princess at the castle, and bumps into Yuri as they're both attempting to leave the castle. Estelle wants to get away, both to broaden her horizons from her sheltered upbringing, and to seek a trusted friend who she is concerned about. She is incredibly naive and is essentially the complete opposite of Yuri, the book smarts to his street smarts. The clash of personalities is used for world building, as Estelle is very knowledgeable of the world despite not experiencing it directly thanks to her book reading, as well as fun interactions between herself and the rest of the cast. Her naivety is used for comic relief in a lot of places, however her innocence and good nature helps temper Yuri's cold persona somewhat, giving the pair a fun dynamic for the writers to play with through skits and throughout the story at large. I think one of Tales of Vesperia's crowning achievements for me, at least in the time I've played it, is that it features a kid character who I don't actively despise. Carol is a kid who gets himself into trouble, but he's not written in a way that I would have expected. In a game like this, one that so heavily invokes anime, I almost reflexively expect any kid character to be written in a hyperactive, almost overly cutesy way. Carol isn't like that. He has some layers to him, and isn't driven by overly simplistic goals, and instead has a touch of some maturity. It was refreshing and relieving to encounter him in a story, and I've enjoyed his inclusion so far. I've always heard of Tales of Asperia's quality, but never played it until recently. From what I've played so far, I think it deserves most of the recognition it's been given. Yuri is a compelling protagonist, bending against the typical JRPG archetype, with a fun and colourful cast to back him up. As a story, I think if we're comparing it to JRPGs that came out near its release, I think Lost Odyssey far and away outdoes this game, but when looking at it within its own series, it certainly sticks out. Helping Vesperia's case is the gameplay too. This is the most refined and best playing version of the classic Tales style. It's not overly bloated, it's responsive, and it's just plain fun to engage with it. I have heard rumblings that Tales of Zillia is better in terms of its combat, but that'll be for another time, I think. Tales of Arise Arise is the latest of the series, and also had one of the longest development times too. Five years separate Berseria from Arise. Namco aiming to make it the first game on the next generation of consoles. The development of the game also included a new engine in the form of the Unreal Engine, providing the best visuals of the series so far in terms of fidelity. The name, Arise, was chosen to imply that the game would be a fresh start for the series, indicating that things would be shaken up somewhat. This is the first game in the series to not be developed on the internal game engine. I think the jump to Unreal mostly speaks for itself, as well as being developed with much more modern hardware in mind. Tales of Bazeri was still developed for the PS3 and it kind of shows in places. There's a fluidity to the animations and cutscenes which is rarely seen in the series up until now, and it's wonderful to see frankly. Everything loads fast, looks great, 
and is punctuated by some nice flashy effects. Combat is extremely fluid and frantic, barely skipping a beat with a rock solid frame rate. Even the presentation of the skits is new, where before these would be merely animated portraits of the characters, they now take on a more manga style with using the in-game models. This allows for a wider degree of poses other than the 5 or 6 typical canned animations. Using the 3D models also means that the characters can be posed from different angles too, so while certain poses are definitely reused, they can take on a new context from the use of camera angles. It's a presentation upgrade that also assists with the storytelling. I don't think this game looks as good as its closest competitor, Dragon Quest XI, which also uses Unreal 4, but that's almost an unfair comparison when you consider the bold art style of Dragon Quest. A rise of always keeps up though, and the fact that I can say that a Tales game is competing in terms of visuals demonstrates the major step up this entry provides. The gameplay of Tales of Arise is both familiar and something entirely different for the series. On one hand, the exploration and structure out of combat is quite familiar JRPG and Tales affair. On the other hand, the combat is radically different from what came before. You're a lot more in control of the movement of the character as combat doesn't take place primarily on a set axis as much anymore. Pressing the attack button now will just make you swing towards the targeted enemy, rather than triggering the character to close the distance automatically. The more direct control derives a much more modern feeling action combat system. The focus being as much on dodging and parrying as it is the more traditional attacking and blocking that characterised the previous games. Special arts are still triggered with a simple press of an assigned button, although the concept of a mana pool for a character is gone as a concept. Each character allowed to chain a certain amount of moves together instead now. In its place is a shared healing resource. Not every character can tap into this, but this allows those that can to access the powerful healing arts and helps simplify the aspect of combat, allowing the action to take centre stage. I really like this new gameplay style to be honest. I think it allows a flow of combat that some of the previous games were only able to allude to, and with it being somewhat of a reboot of the combat systems, it doesn't feel as bloated as some of the other games too. I look forward to seeing how they evolve further off this in a future game. Tales of Arise seems to be the darkest of the series so far, at least in terms of overall tone. Berseria maybe has it beat in terms of how dark the game starts with its inciting incident, but the overall tone of Arise feels a touch more post-apocalyptic. The setting is bleak. The people of the world, the Danans, are oppressed from an invading army from the nearby world of Renna. Danna is a world very typical of fantasy RPGs, a more medieval setting, whereas Renna is a world of advanced technology, which is what gave them the edge in their invasion. The game mostly revolves around the Danan slave amnesiac, Alfen, known early on simply as Iron Mask, who can't feel pain, and Shion, a rebelling member of the oppressive Renans, who appears to have a curse known as Thorns, which makes her inadvertently shock whoever touches her. Some Danans refer to her derogatively as Bright Eyes, which is a reference to how Renan eyes light up when they use magical abilities. Their character designs are linked into their personal stories and personalities. Alfen wears a mask he can't take off, which represents his amnesia, which early on is broken revealing his face and restoring part of his memory. The mask also represents how he doesn't necessarily judge people by where they're from and instead by their actions, hence his connection with Shion. Shion is designed to look regal, hinting to her background, but her curse of thorns is also reflected in her prickly personality, very standoffish and withdrawn within herself, accepting help begrudgingly and keeping her goals mostly to herself even when pushed for reasons. As such, the pair of Shion and Alfen is almost perfect as a protagonist duo, as they complement each other effortlessly. Alfen is the only one who can withstand being close to Shion due to his inability to feel pain, and as such he becomes one of the few people she feels she can trust. This is cemented early on when Alfen, Iron Mask at the time, is able to pull the Blade of Flame from the Master Core that Shion possesses. Alfen also seems to vaguely recognise Shion from his hazy memory, which adds to a further level of mystery to their relationship. Tales of Arise, in my opinion, successfully modernises the Tales series with its various quality of life changes, a soft reset on the mechanic bloat, and a significant improvement of the graphics and presentation. It, of course, still feels slightly lower budget than its big name competitors, but the gulf this time feels not quite as significant. From what I've played, this is just an overall solid action RPG, and one that is very easy to recommend. It might be hard to go back to the series though due to the gameplay differences, but the new system is mostly a new flavour rather than a completely new style. Overall Conclusions Having played through a decent chunk of these five games, I can confirm that the analysis of this series being comfort food JRPGs is an apt one. 
That's not to say that these games are bad, far from it really. It's more that these games don't really try to do anything too radical and mostly stick to their tried and true methods. The combat separates it from the systems of other major JRPG series and is consistently a very fun and engaging part of the games as a whole. The stories can range in quality, but mostly skew towards being pretty good, hinging on the consistently good character writing and succeeding. Tales of Hearts was the only one of the games I played where I felt that wasn't the case, with its mix of annoying characters, to me, and a plot which I found unengaging in the early hours. From what I've played, there are two recommendations here for people wanting to get into this series. If you want to experience what is considered the pinnacle of the older style of the games, then you can't go wrong with Vesperia. It has great characters, nice graphics in the remaster, and a really great refined combat system. I've heard Tales of Symphonia is also considered one of the best older games too, although I haven't played that one myself yet. If you don't want to dive into something that may come across as a bit older, then the latest game is honestly a perfect entry point. Tales of Arise's modernizations make it very approachable, and its strengths are still faithful to the series, them being the engaging combat, anime style, and great character writing. So yeah, I found a series I quite enjoy now, which is always something nice to find. Nowadays, it feels like the genre has taken a bit of a backseat, with very few big budget releases unlike a decade or so ago. While the Tales series isn't exactly massive budget, although they do come out at a steadier pace than Final Fantasy and especially Dragon Quest, there is a bit more of a resurgence for the genre in recent years, thanks mostly to the indie scene with Chained Echoes being a great recent example, and the latest Yakuza slash Like a Dragon game being a turn-based RPG. Tales has been around for a while though, and provided some solid JRPG action in the PS4 era when things were a little drier, and I appreciate that. Thanks for watching, and catch you again next time.